Good morning, everybody. It's great to see all of you here. What a beautiful day to be able to come together and worship the Lord. Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you will. Come with me, please. If you've got a pew Bible, you might like to take hold of it. Turn to page 84, and we're going to be looking a little bit in the book of Leviticus. And you'll find a pew Bible in the uh, shelf in front of you. So avail yourselves of one of those. And uh, let's talk about guilt. Have you ever felt guilty? Have you ever done something that you didn't mean to do, and then you felt guilty about that very thing? I read recently a, a story of, of one guy who was older and he was cleaning his mother's house and he found a book, I think it was uh, King of Thieves or something along those lines, but he found a book that he borrowed from school and forgotten to return and it was 47 years later that he found the book. <laughs> He said uh, he thought he should take it back rather than leaving it for another 10 years or so. So he took the book back to the library where he had borrowed the book from and he had to pay $173 or $172.13 to compensate for having that book out for that long. There are things in our lives that we do unintentionally. When we're looking at the offering, the guilt offering today, it speaks about unintentional sins, the things that we don't mean to do but we do. And in the book of Leviticus, it talks about the guilt offering in regards to, one, when we unintentionally sin against the Lord, and secondly, when we unintentionally sin against one another. I want us to look in the book of Leviticus and talk about the guilt offering and then bring it from that place over into the New Testament and into our lives today and glean some principles that we can apply to our lives from this wonderful offering. First, I want to take you back and I want to have a look at some of those wonderful offerings that Pastor Timon has been sharing with us over the past weeks, just to refresh ourselves in regards to what they were. But before we do that, let's pray together. Father, thank you for this privilege of being able to gather here today. Lord, um, we have all struggled with guilt. Father, we've all done things that we didn't intend to do. And Father, I thank you that you speak into that. Father, we do things that wound you and hurt you, and we do those unintentionally. We thank you that you speak to that. We do things that wound one another, that wound our community. We thank you that you have given us clear instruction in that. So we come humbly before you now and ask that you would speak to us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The first offering that Pastor Timon spoke to us about, and it'll be up on the screen for you, is the burnt offering, where God laid out this intricate detail on how the nation of Israel could come to God and have God's righteous anger towards our sin, God's just anger towards our sin appeased. Now, God is a holy God, and it's, it's right that He's angry about our sin. And in the the Old Testament, they had a very detailed, very clearly laid out process for coming to the living God. And today, we have this wonderful, wonderful news that Jesus Christ is our burnt offering. He is the one that has paid the price before God on our behalf so that we no longer have to suffer the anger of God, but that we can be forgiven for our sin. Isn't that great news? Isn't that great news? That we won't suffer the wrath of God if we have trusted Him by faith because Jesus is our burnt offering. The second offering, that one of the other offerings that we look at and the second one I want to speak to you about is the peace offering where the nation of Israel were instructed how they could come and make an offering before God that spoke about their relationship with God so that how they could have peace with a God whom they were enemies with once before, whom their sin offends. And similarly for us, we need to experience the peace of God because the Bible tells us that when we sin against God, when we walk with no regard for God, when we walk like unbelievers, we in fact are at enmity with God. We, we, we don't have peace with God. And yet, praise God, Again, as we come over into the New Testament, Jesus Christ is our peace offering. He paid the price, he shed his blood, and now we can have peace with God. Don't you find that exciting? Yeah. 
I don't know if you know what it's like not to have peace. You know how when, when you're out of sorts with somebody and you don't have peace, the anxiety that that causes? To know that we can have peace with our Creator. The third thing I want us to see is the sin offering. Sin causes us to be stained within. We are stained by our sin. We are separated from God by our sin. It marks our lives. And God cannot abide sin. God cannot be in the presence of sin. And the nation of Israel used to come forward and make a a very intricate offering before God so that their sin, the stain of their sin in their life could be forgiven and they could be made right with God. And again, Jesus is our sin offering. He is the one who has laid down his life. And we read in the scriptures that we are washed with the water of the word. We are washed by the blood of Christ. We are made clean in the sight of God. The stain of sin has been removed. And when God looks upon us, he sees us as holy. Isn't that wonderful? Sees us set apart, pure for him. But the one I wanna talk to you about today is the guilt offering. The guilt offering is different to the other offerings. It has some distinct things about it that we can take and principles that we can take, move over into the New Testament and apply to our lives. And the guilt offering talks about sins that we commit by accident, things that we do to not only offend God, but one of the distinct things about the guilt offering, it talks about how we offend one another. So it talks about how we sin against God unintentionally and how we can sin against one another unintentionally. And the key word I want you to see, come with me now in your Bibles into chapter 5 and then chapter 6. Come to chapter 5, verse 14, page 84 in your pew Bible. And then I want to jump into chapter 6. I just want you to see this, this phrase. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, verse 14, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, if anyone commits a, what does it say? A, come on, what does it say? Breach. A breach of faith. If anybody commits a breach of faith against the living God, there needs to be an offering made for that. I'm going to explain what I think breach of faith Means. Come with me again in your Bibles now down to chapter 6. And here, the Lord is speaking about how we sin against our neighbours, how we sin against one another. And in verse 1, chapter 6, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, If anyone sins and commits a breach, breach of faith, And the way that he equates these two things is first he talks about how we sin and have a breach of faith against God. And then secondly, he talks about when we sin and commit a breach of faith faith against one another, he says we sin against the Lord in both. God takes the breach of faith against him and a breach of faith against other people or people seriously. He takes that as an offence both ways. And yet God lays out for us a clear way that we can begin to deal with that. What I'd like to do is I'd like to start in chapter 6. I want to talk about you and me first, and then I want to go back and talk about how we have a breach of faith with God. But let's talk about how we breach the faith with one another and what that exactly means. The dictionary definition of that, a breach of faith, is defined this way. It's when we violate or have a violation of good faith. It's when we break trust. It's when we break confidence. It's when we betray one another. It's when we abandon our friends. That's what it is to have a breach of faith. It's when we say that we have a commitment to one another, when we make an agreement with one another and we break that agreement. And in the book of Leviticus, when it comes to people, God outlines two ways that we break the faith with one another. And the first one of those is that we lie to one another. And the second way that we breach faith with one another is that we take advantage of the weak. A little while back, Carol and I had our 30th anniversary, which is like a really expensive one. It's pearls. Do you know how, like, they are ridiculously expensive. 
But fortunately, at uh, the North Park Shopping Centre, they had some fake ones, so I went down there <laughs> to buy some for Carol. So I jumped in my large 80 series four-wheel drive. I had some counselling and some pastoral ministry to do and I had this little window of time so I raced down to the shopping centre and I squeezed my 80 series into a car park and as I turned in, I noticed the car beside me started to rock back and forward like that. There was nobody in it. What had happened is I just nudged it with my bumper. And when I say just nudged, I got out and had a look at my car and it, had a, it didn't even have a paint mark on it, it just had a little, you know, got my fingers, wet them, and sort of rubbed it out. And then I looked at his car, and there was a dent from the fuel cap through the back door to the front door. 1,500, and it, and it was a Toyota Camry. I don't even know why they have those. But... <laughs> And at that moment, as I was uh, looking at his car, I've got to tell you, in my heart, I was thinking, did anybody see me? Maybe I should just get back in the car and back out and go and find another car park, wait for some dummy to pull up and park next to him. <laughs> but God was good to me that day because the gentleman that owned the car happened to be standing 10 feet away and watched me pull in and slam into the side of his car. He came over and he was angry and I... I can understand that. I was trying to be polite to him. And I, I gave him my details. I, he took down my, uh, my uh, registration number and he asked me for my phone number. Again, my heart thought, maybe I'll just give him like most of the numbers and maybe one wrong. <laughs> I gave him my right number and he then immediately rang it to see if I was telling the truth. <laughs> Push. <laughs> but you see, we have this ability to, to lie to one another, to deceive one another for our, our own gain. To be honest with you, I would have just preferred to have been able to go in and buy those imitation pearls and roll out of the car park again and only spend that amount of money. But those pearls cost me $1,500 more than I expected. Okay? When Carol puts those little plastic earrings on, I look at them and think, they look expensive. <laughs> We have this innate desire at times to lie to gain. We, we distort the truth and we harm one another. And what God says that is, is that we are breaching the faith with one another. Further, he goes on to talk about taking advantage or, and not only just, it's, it's unusual because the, the passage in Leviticus talks about unintentional sin, but then it talks about robbery. And the implication is that the guilt offering not only talks about unintentional sin, but sometimes we choose to do the wrong thing. We oppress the weak. We distort the truth so that we can get gain. We do this in our workplaces. Just recently on the news, only last night on the news and yesterday, there was a particular chain of service stations that have been underpaying their people so that they could gain, halve their wage. And because they were generally students on a visa, they intimidated them for their own gain. And this is the implication that God is speaking about here, about how we distort the truth for our own gain. But I want you to think about it this way too, just on a personal level. I've been a pastor here for coming up for a year, Prior to that, I've been here for nine years and a good portion of that time was an elder. Prior to that, I came here as a student decades ago and so people in the church know me and I have a, a position of authority within the church. That makes sense, doesn't it? I don't, I'm not lording that over you, but that's just a reality, isn't it? And with that comes a great responsibility because if, as it happened in one situation in my life, in recent times where you have an upset with somebody, something goes wrong, you have a difficult time, something, your relationship's not going well with someone else. And you have a choice then with, a, with authority. I could have um, oppressed that, that guy or that girl. I could have ignored them. I have a fair bit of position in the church. I could have marginalised them. And even though they may have told their side and I told my side, I've been here for a fair amount of time and I've had a position of authority and I could have made it very difficult for them. I just could have ignored it and made it tough. Using what I have to harm another person. 
And God says that when we do that, we not only sin against that person, but we are effectively sinning directly against God. It's a breach of faith. And what I mean is that this brother or sister was just that. They were my brother and sister in the Lord. It means we were bound together by the same Lord, by the same God, by the same Saviour, by the same baptism, by the same blessing. And as a result, we have an unwritten agreement that we ought to love one another as Christ has loved us. I think about my own life when I think about this. I was, I was born into an unbelieving family. I was born like all of you were. I was born in my sin. And I was living a life of rebellion and I was living a life where I didn't have any regard for God. I did not care for God. I did not know God. I didn't want to know God. And even that which I knew of God, I was suppressing and pushing away so that I could continue to live the way I lived. And God in his great mercy reached into the darkness and took my miserable life and drew me out and saved me. He could have ignored me. He could have crushed me. He could have sent me to hell. And yet in his love and in his mercy, rather than abusing his authority, rather than abusing his power, not that he would have been an abuse to do this to me, but he could have easily ignored me. In a similar way, the application I have for that when I come out of the book of Leviticus and see that we ought not to breach the faith is that we need to show love the love of Christ to one another. We need to put one another first. The other thing I want you to see in the book of Leviticus for me, just come with me quickly. Come with me now down to verse 6, chapter 5, and verse 6, uh, sorry, verse 16. He shall also make restitution for what he has done amiss in the holy thing and shall add a, what does it say? A fifth. So not only are we seeing here that we need to make an offering because we have breached the faith, but the second thing I want you to see about this offering is that it has this element of that not only do we make an offering, but we also make compensation. We also have to restore something. We have to add something to that. So when we breach the faith with one another, when we breach the faith, we not only have to ask for forgiveness, but we have to make compensation for what we've done. It's not enough for me to get out of my car and say to that guy, I'm really sorry I hit your car. Please forgive me. And he says, yeah, no problem. And then I get back in my Land Cruiser and I drive off. I had to make compensation. I gave him my phone numbers. I gave him my registration. I gave him the details of my insurance company. And then my insurance company weren't following through as quickly as what I thought they would and he began to get nervous because he again wondered whether I was going to breach the faith with him. And he would ring me and I I ended up with a new friend who continued to ring me every week, bless his little heart. When we breach the faith with one another, we not only have to seek forgiveness but we need to make compensation. When you're in your yard and you're a builder and you're clearing your yard and you've got a really tall tree and you go to the tree and think, I've got to cut that tree down so I can get the new house on the block that I want. So you stand by the tree and you look which way it leans and you think, yep, if I cut it this way, it's going to fall down the block and land just where I want it to. So you get your chainsaw out and you cut it and some demon comes along, grabs that tree and tips it into your neighbor's yard and it smashes through his garage. Now, your neighbor gets upset with that. That's been my experience anyhow. (laughs) It's been a breach of faith because my neighbour believed that when I was going to move in next door that I wouldn't be cutting down trees that landed on his garage. That seems reasonable, doesn't it? Okay, He's not even a believer, my neighbour. You see, breaching the faith is not just about us being the family of God. That, I want to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But breaching the faith, we can breach the faith with unbelievers because they have been made in the image of God and they deserve to be treated in a particular way with respect and care. And so when I apologised to my neighbour for his shed and what was in his shed that now didn't work anymore and replaced his shed for him, that was the end of the matter. I'd asked for forgiveness and the shed had been replaced. 
No, that wasn't the end of the matter because my neighbour felt violated. He thought he could trust me. We had an unwritten code, as we do as friends and neighbours, that we have an unwritten code that we trust one another. And he felt that trust had been broken. And so I realised that I had an obligation to make compensation, not just for the property, but I needed to restore faith with him. So how do we do that? In the Old Testament and Leviticus, the way the sacrifices went was that you brought a ram in and you, you offered the ram and then you bought a, a 20% offering on top of that so that you could restore faith, make compensation. I'd already fixed up his shed, but now I needed to fix up our relationship and, and giving him 50 bucks and saying, look, I hope your heart heals. I hope this will help you trust me more. It just doesn't work. And what we did was to cook a cake and to go to them and say, we are genuinely sorry, not just about the shed, but about the fact that we wanted to express to you that we care for you and that we value it as neighbours, and we want to restore the faith with you that, that I had broken because of my action. I didn't intend to drop that tree on him, but it happened. Does that make sense? Yeah. Let's take this a little bit further. What about a husband and a wife? And there's been adultery in the relationship. And the wife has been unfaithful to the husband. The husband may have been unfaithful to the wife. And there's been a breach of trust because this couple, as all married couples do, stand before the living God and say, I will choose to be faithful to this one person. I will exclude all others and I will choose to be faithful in my body, in my heart and in my mind to this one person. And you breach the faith. You commit adultery. And it comes in so many different forms. Sometimes they pursue it with a relentless heart and sometimes it comes into their life because they've been lazy and haven't been guarding their heart. And there's confession and forgiveness offered. But how then do you compensate a wife or a husband for, for what's happened? You've asked for forgiveness. But how do you compensate them for the broken trust how do you compensate them for the pain in their heart? How do you compensate them as they try to get back on their feet and, and walk again in a relationship that's easy and precious? And the way I see compensation coming from Leviticus into our lives in this way is you lay your life open. The compensation is your phone. You lay your phone open and you don't make it hard for him or her to see where you've been. You lay your internet account open and make it transparent. You don't make them fight for it. You don't make them ask for it. You don't make them put, embarrass themselves by wondering about it. You are proactive. You are going ahead and, and, and compensating for the trust that you have broken. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. The obligation from Leviticus is on upon us. It's not enough to say, I'm sorry. It's not enough to say that I have faith. And then the word of God cries out, you say you have faith, you prove it to me by the way you live your life. You, you've breached the faith. And here I am grappling with trying to put it all back together again because of what you have done. And we are obligated through compensation, not just simply to sit on our fat little tush and hope it works out, but we are obligated by faith to run ahead and lay open the path so that the one that we have wounded can be restored. Yeah. Do you understand that? Does that make sense? Breaching the faith. We can do it with believers and unbelievers. But it's even worse when we do it amongst the family of God. I want to show you some passages. Matthew, I want to jump a couple of passages. If you'll bring me down, please, to Ephesians chapter 4 and, 4 and verse 6. Have a listen to this. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to one hope, that belongs to your call. How many lords are there? One. How many faiths are there? One. How many baptisms are there? One God, yeah, amen. One Father. One God and Father of all, who is in all and through all and in all. We are, through the Lord Jesus Christ, we are family. We are one together. We are the body of Christ. 
And therefore, the, the implication is that we ought to treat one another with extraordinary care. There is a, an unwritten code of faith amongst us. And when we break that faith, we not only sin against one another, but we sin against God. And God is saying that we need to restore the faith. So how do I restore the faith with Carol? I've been a complete dope. I try to keep it to once a week if I can. So I go out the back and I get the ram that we've named Buffy and I drag the ram inside into the kitchen. We've got a lino floor, so it's okay. And I send Buffy to be with the Lord. Just one quick shot through the throat. Okay. And then I get my wallet out and I give Carol 50 bucks for compensation. Now, that doesn't happen very often in our house. It's nuts, isn't it? You see, what this wonderful news is for us is that Jesus Christ is our offering. He is our guilt offering. He has paid the price so that not only can I receive forgiveness, but so that I can give forgiveness. So I don't need to drag the ram in from the backyard anymore and slaughter it in the kitchen because God has gone before me in the Lord Jesus Christ and has paid the price for my sin. So I'm able to go to my beautiful wife and say, please forgive me. Please forgive me for what I've done. And then the way that I see my compensation in this matter is that I treat her with tenderness and I treat her with care and I am mindful of the wound that I have caused and I make room for her. I die to myself so that I'm able to live. I die to my own desires so that I can be a blessing, so that I can compensate for the wound that I have caused. Jesus taught that loving God and loving others or well, one's neighbours go hand in hand. You see that? In Leviticus, he says to us that when you breach the faith with people in the community who are made in the image of God, and when you breach the faith with the people within your family, the church family, you sin against God. And we need to be proactive in restoring that relationship, making compensation for that. I want you to come with me now. I want to show you a passage that really does explain this beautifully. Matthew, could you bring us down to Philippians chapter 2, please? 3 and 4. Well done. Do nothing from... Thank you. It's really cool the way you get that to echo through the congregation. Did you guys practice that or does that just happen by accident? <laughs> Do nothing through... Selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others. Wow, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not only look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. And this passage is not just out there on its own, it's some little ditto thing that is sort of good for Christians to do. This passage is couched in the example of Christ because he was willing to not be conceited, but in humility, he laid down his life for us. He laid down his life that we might be benefited. And he's saying the same for us as, as the family of God. We are family. Don't break the faith. Serve others before you serve yourself. Lay down your life. Be that person who is Christ-like in the way that you treat others. So we can break faith with one another, but how do, we, how do we break faith with God? What does that look like? Come in your Bibles with me. Come back with me if you can to chapter 5 and verse 14. And the Lord said to Moses saying, If anyone commits a breach of faith and sins unintentionally in any of the holy things of the Lord... He shall bring to the Lord as his compensation a ram without blemish out of the flock, valued in silver shekels according to the shekel of the sanctuary for a guilt offering. And he shall make restitution for what he has done amiss in the holy things. And then the Lord lays out for us how we break faith with God. And I want to talk to you about what that looks like. And then he shows us, I believe, in the Word of God, how we can restore faith with God, how we find his forgiveness, how we can, in a sense, compensate God for what we've done. There's four ways that are laid out in verses 13 to 16 of chapter 5. 
And I want to summarise them this way. The first way that we break faith with God is that we worship, is the worship of God must be done in a respectful manner. God says to the nation of Israel, when you, when you disregard the holy things of God, when you misuse the things of God, you break faith with me. Treat me with respect. Treat me the way I deserve to be treated. New Testament parallel of this is in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 27 when the, the young church of Corinth were coming around the communion table. We do it in a very sanitised manner. They shared a meal together. Some of the guys were coming to the table drunk. People were pushing in and taking advantage. And when an outsider looked in at the people taking communion, which was an expression of their unity, it looked Ugly. And it didn't represent the fact that they believed that God was a holy God that deserved to be treated with respect and with awe. And similarly, when we come to worship the living God, we ought to treat him with great awe and great respect. He is not to be taken lightly. The second way is we rob God of his rightful due when we claim to believe in him and then we live like an unbeliever. So many times over the years, guys came on the building site and told us that they were a bricklayer. Do you know the best way to find out if a person's a bricklayer? Ask him to lay some bricks. One guy, we let him lay bricks for a day. It took two days to repair the job. Man, what a dope. And yet if you'd listened to him, you'd think he was the bee's knees, but he was hopeless. Similarly, when we say that we belong to the living God and that into our lives and he's saved us and he's made us a new creation and then we go out and live like an unbeliever. We rob God of the glory that he's due. He has changed us, then why do you continue to live like you do? You go out on the, you're at home with your wife and the pastor comes around and it's yes sir, no sir, three bags full sir and you leave and pray and there's a beautiful couple of, you might even be clever enough to reference a scripture passage to show him how devoted you are and then you step on the building site and you'd swear that your mouth was, you know what I'm talking about and they tell dirty jokes and you join in and you look nothing like a believer. And you do it in the workplace everywhere, folks. We do this in the office as well. We hide our faith. We giggle at the dirty stories. We get angry and behave poorly and come along to church on Sunday and are glad that nobody really knows. But be mindful of this. You are robbing God of his rightful due. He deserves you to live a life that reflects that he's changed you, to be devoted people. Thirdly, is that we rob God when we fail to give him our all. Have a look in your Bibles, page 968. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It says this, For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saint, but, also, but it is also overflowing in many thanksgiving to God. And God is connecting the dots for us and saying that everything that I have given you is not so you can go out and buy a bigger TV than your oldest son. The way I have blessed you is so that you have the privilege of using the gifts that God has given you so that you can be involved in blessing other people. But we constantly rob God by not giving him everything that we have, not giving him our hearts. Fourthly, we can trivialise the name of the Lord. We can blame God for things that he has not done. We can misuse the name of God. We can describe God in ways that doesn't reflect his power and his glory. This is beautifully described in the book of Job. Let me read to you what he says in the book of Job to the friends of Job, as Job went through suffering, his friends came alongside and they tried to give him advice, but in fact what they did was they described God in the wrong way. They assigned things to God that didn't reflect how wonderful God was. They spoke about God incorrectly and he says this to them, after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, 
the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Terminite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right. Many times I've looked at my own life and thought, when I've heard in a conversation something said about God that I know is not true, I've remained silent in case I offend them. And on reflection, I should have said something because God is worthy. But we can often misrepresent God this way. The key that I want you to take away from today is when we look at the guilt offering. The guilt offering speaks to us about breaching the faith with one another and breaching the faith with God. And the guilt offering speaks to us about how we compensate God and how we compensate one another. How do we compensate God when we breach the faith with him? Because Jesus is our offering. Jesus has made it possible for us to come to God and seek forgiveness. And really there's nothing that we can give to God that he hasn't given to us. But what response is God looking for from us? When we come to God and say, God, I'm sorry, how does God want us to do that? Have a look with me. Well, let me read it to you because I think King David nails this one. After having murdered a man and taken his wife as his own, having committed adultery, having sinned against God, having breached the faith with God, he came before God and sought forgiveness. But I want you to see how he came before God. Have a look if you have the opportunity. It's page 474, Psalm 51, verse 17. And David says these profound words, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. When we breach the faith with God, praise his name, Jesus has paid the price so that we can be right with God again. And the way that we access that forgiveness and that blessing from God, the way that we access a restoration to our relationship, the way that we apologise for the harm that we have caused to our relationship and the hurt that we have to God is we come not with arrogance or pride, but with contrition and humility and brokenness. And make no mistake, God knows the difference. And you do too. You have had people apologise to you and you can see it written all over their face. They don't mean one word of what they're saying. And there have been other people who have come to you and they can barely get the words out and you know that they're sorry. And make no mistake, God knows the difference. Let us come before him with a contrite and broken heart. I want to share with you one last verse, Colossians chapter 2, because I want to finish with this. Jesus is our guilt offering. He has paid the price before God so we can be forgiven. He is our compensation. And you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us of our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. <laughs> this is just awesome. Isn't it great news? Now when you crash that tree down on your neighbour's house, you know how you can restore the breach of faith with them. And you know what that looks like. When you break the faith with one another within the church here and hurt one another, you know now how to restore that. Jesus Christ has already paid the price. You need to go with a broken and contrite heart and do whatever it takes to restore the faith. But much more importantly, when we break the faith with God, Jesus Christ has already paved the way for us to be forgiven. And we can come like David with a contrite and broken heart and we can restore that relationship that we have broken. 
Isn't that great news? Yes. Wouldn't it be awful if we were just trapped in the corner? So I want to say to you today, those of you that are carrying guilt, those of you who have unintentionally robbed the Lord of the things that he deserves, and those of you that have unintentionally wounded your friends and you've been ignoring it, I beg of you to humble yourself before the Lord. Seek the Lord that you might have a broken and contrite heart. Go in the strength of God and ask for forgiveness. And reflect to them however you physically can that you want to compensate them for the break of faith, that you want to not only be forgiven, but you want to restore the faith together. Let us not break faith with one another. Let us not break faith with God. Let's pray together.